Okay, so we'll just carry on, and uh, this is our part two, in which we have an uh, overview of Stephen Porges and the polyvagal theory. And just that for openers, I would offer to you that, in my opinion, the Stephen Porges is really uh, bringing a revolution in healthcare. Um, understanding the autonomic nervous system as it is, as it really is, instead of the 100-year-old model that we all learned in school, is a key to bridging hard science with psychology. With uh, Stephen Porges's material, we are able to create a solid foundation for uh, understanding the effects, for instance, of creating rapport, creating a sense of safety, uh, communication skills, and many of the other um, features of an effective uh, psychology. Uh, not, uh, not to mention the whole uh, the the body centered aspect. We can really, uh, if we could understand the autonomic nervous system in its full implications we will um, have transformation in our healthcare systems and our birthing practices, our emergency care, in our early childhood education, our later childhood education, just right down the line. I am convinced that Stephen Porges has brought us a, a real uh, essential value, a, a priceless uh, bit of new uh, information. So, um, in essence, polyvagal theory, the word polyvagal, is sometimes it throws people off, but all it means is that the vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10, has multiple uh, nuclei, and three on each side of those nuclei conform to the normal uh, parasympathetic classification that is, you know, the vagus is the uh, royalty of the parasympathetic anatomy, but one is non-conforming, and that's the, uh, is shown on your diagram in blue, the nucleus ambiguous, or the so-called ventral vagus, and um, I would just recommend that uh, take a little time and get comfortable with these new terms. Uh, nucleus ambiguous, ventral vagus, that's referring to a non-parasympathetic branch of the um, vagus nerve, which innervates the face, neck, throat, and has strands to the heart as well. And it was the discovery that this branch did not conform that set Porges on his way to his big discovery. And his um, main conclusion is that there are three neural circuits which are forming a hierarchy that regulates behavioral adaptation. So that's three, not two. That is, we all learned in school there were two sympathetic and parasympathetic, or if you're of the old school or European, it would be orthosympathetic and parasympathetic. But there's a third one, and we're calling it the social branch. So social, sympathetic, and parasympathetic, and they form a, a response hierarchy that is, we all learned in school that it was kind of like a seesaw. They were reciprocal in their action. One goes on, one goes off. And uh, daytime alertness, nighttime rest. Um, however, in this new model, they're actually sequential. They do have some reciprocal features. And in some cases, they do have you know, on-off functions. But from a behavioral point of view, there's three branches, and they're sequential, not reciprocal. So that's the bottom line of polyvagal theory. And now we can maybe go into that in a little more detail. We want to set a context 
for it first, I think, just to show how important this could be. So I have a couple of examples for you, and perhaps you're familiar with at least one of them already. But uh, I'll just talk you through them a little bit anyway. The first one's called The Rescuing Hug. And in this story, this is 18 years ago, two twin girls were born. One was flourishing and the other was fading and not expected to live. And the nurse who was attending them had the insight, well, they were together before and one's fading. Maybe I'll put them in the same little bassinet together. So she did, and the one threw her arm over the other, and the second one, the weaker one, uh, heart rate stabilized, temperature rose to normal, and she made a full recovery. So something happened. The physiology of what happened in that sequence is of great interest. That is... Something happened here that modern medicine could not have created through any intervention. Saving the life of that girl was accomplished through an autonomic nervous system correction, which was involuntary. Obviously, there was no coaching, no training. There was no exercises or therapies applied. It was just innate instinctual recovery, the resetting of the system through invoking the third branch, previously not identified. The social autonomic nervous system was engaged when the stronger one threw her arm over. The weaker one immediately began a reset. The neurochemistry changes because in the hierarchy, the social is the highest, strongest, newest, most effective, most powerful branch. And so we got this very happy outcome. And there's a wonderful uh, YouTube clip of a CNN interview with these girls 18 years later. You could search for that using rescuing hug as search terms. And we see the twin girls now, seniors in high school, and, uh, yeah, you know, having a little banter in their home in the kitchen. And um, Porges, watching that video with his uh, skill with micro gestures, uh, was able to easily identify which was which. Uh, so I recommend that to you. It's very heartwarming to uh, see these girls 18 years later still supporting each other. And the bond between them is obviously a huge resource. So then let's look at another one just to uh, sort of uh, expand the story a little bit. This is a program in Canada called Roots of Empathy. It started in Alberta, and in this program, um, the government hires new mothers to bring their very young children and just sit in classrooms. They don't have to do anything. There's no training, no preparation. The mothers are happy to do it, the babies enjoy it, and the children are just transformed by the experience. The What is happening here, you bring a baby in, and we can't do it on the Internet, but if I'm teaching a class and you're all in the room with me, if we bring a baby in, the class will stop because we're autonomically, involuntarily programmed to respond and we'll all have a surge of vasopressin and oxytocin and the neurochemistry of wellness, which then has the capacity to override any sympathetic or parasympathetic um, experiences, uh, states that we might be in. So they just bring the babies in. They just sit them there, and the behavioral problems disappear. Test scores go up. And the teachers report numerous peripheral benefits. And if you look closely at the um, picture, look at the quality of um, gaze in the baby and in the children. There's this very um, rich um, engagement. That's the social nervous system involuntarily. Nobody had any training in how to do this. 
Nobody coached them and said, oh, look at the baby. It just arises innately from within. And uh, and then look on the far right, and you can see these are all different academic projects that have been developed based on the program. You can see all of the uh, benefits. These are PhD theses that were created for various uh, different degrees and so on. And it's just a fantastic list. So the hierarchy of social nervous system as having the power and the capacity to um, flood through sympathetic and parasympathetic states and restore optimum function is once again being demonstrated. And then we have one more uh, to offer you. This is the phenomenon of therapy dogs. And um, I put this one in there because I know Diane has talked about this a lot in her uh, classes. And it's been discovered that uh, children, uh, especially if they're having trouble with ADD and things like that, ADHD, um, that they will be able to learn to read much more effectively if they just happen to be in the uh, companionship or lie resting against a docile dog, a pet. And um, we could, again, inquire, you know, what's the physiology of this? Why does it work? Well, it's because the social nervous system has the power to override sympathetic and parasympathetic states. The, the uh, children come into the classroom from their homes where all manner of complexities exist, and they're still in the states of, you know, their habitual states, and they are maybe even becoming fixated in those states. And by introducing an involuntary um, stimulus, we get an innate response restoring the uh, so sort of the full range of motion of the autonomic nervous system. The same concept has been demonstrated in programs with seniors. Uh, programs in hospital recovery times are faster and so on. Many good resources, and I just recommend you can uh, pursue this one if you like. Just uh, uh, Google something like therapy dogs or uh, similar. Um, another whole area of interest is horses. Some very excellent results are being obtained using horses. And, uh, you know, a fascination. Again, what is the physiology? Why? Obviously it works, but why does it work? And the social nervous system is the answer. So then we could just uh, take it a little further. And we're going to have to learn another new term. And that's the term phylogeny. So uh, bear with me. Perhaps you took biology in, uh, at some point and you had to learn ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. That was used to torture uh, high school students at one time. And uh, it's not true, actually. Uh, but uh, phylogeny refers to the appearance of features across different life forms. So, for example... Even a single-celled organism floating in a liquid medium has some form of digestion and respiration. Everybody's got it somehow. But it develops and becomes more and more sophisticated as we climb up the so-called evolutionary tree. And the study of phylogeny is quite interesting. You know, all form and function can be traced through different life forms. So. Uh, Porges shows that in vertebrates, we have uh, the development in heart regulation, which is our number one essence of biological survival. We have up arrows, followed by down arrows, followed by more up arrows, and lastly, only in mammals, is another down arrow. And what this is doing is creating a waveform of excitation and rest. So 
uh, expansion is the upward arrows and contraction are the downward arrows. And this creates a waveform that has been often used to create the so-called window of tolerance or the, uh, Peter Levine shows it as a river that overflows its banks and it moves in a nice waveform of excitation and quiet. And then if it goes outside that, above, outside of the banks, and it crests, and we have a trauma vortex, um, these are the uh, terms that have been used to describe something that here we can see it specifically in anatomy and physiology. The chromatin tissue is not considered automatic. It's just tissue, just uh, in the muscles itself. But the dorsal motor nucleus, the red column, that's parasympathetic. And then you see you have two parts of sympathetic. You have sympathetic itself, and then the adrenal uh, is in reptiles and mammals. And then only in the last do we have the ventral motor nucleus, the ventral vagus, cranial nerve 10, nucleus ambiguous again taking us down. And what this is doing is giving us ever increasing range of motion. So the later life forms can get active and go quiet in a much more sophisticated way. And it's all in the service of survival. Everything here is under the dominant imperative of survival. A little footnote here for those who have been following Porges, because I keep hearing this slightly misunderstood. For instance, at the uh, Networker Symposium, maybe some of you were there, that sometimes the dorsal motor nucleus and the ventral vagus are kind of lumped together because they are both slowing the heart, making them easily confused, but they're actually quite distinct anatomically and in terms of phylogeny. So when you hear that, this is an opportunity to just have that little minor correction. So then let's move along. And we are now ready to sort of dig in a little further. Here we have, in Porges' own language, the three branches of the uh, autonomic nervous system. And one is the most primitive passive feeding and reproduction system, metabolic baseline of operation. That's your parasympathetic autonomic nervous system in its normal function. And then a little bit newer, we have mobilization. Uh, a new set of nerves and the ganglia which uh, create the effects of mobility. And this has tremendous advantages for feeding, defense, and reproduction. Now, if the uh, environment is getting too hot or too cold, we could move away instead of just trying to sit it out, as we would have to do with a purely parasympathetic response. And then lastly, the social engagement. This is the new, newly articulated and the most modern. Here's Porges' own language for describing it. A sophisticated set of responses supporting massive cortical development, enabling maternal bonding, the extended protection of vulnerable immature cortex processors, and social cooperation, language and social structures via facial functions. So as we get into mammals, we have a biological problem, a survival problem, which is as the cortex increases in size, the period of dependency also increases because it takes more and more time for those uh, neural networks to be formed the, and tested and then pruned. It takes time. So uh, as you get into mammals, uh, we'll start, for example, with birds and reptiles. They are born, and pretty quickly they are pretty... Uh, mobile, they are pretty functional. As you get into mammals, even dogs and cats or horses, you can watch a birth and you can see really within a relatively short time of hours or um, a day or so, 
you know, they're uh, able to move around a little bit and uh, start to be more functional. Whereas with primates, it takes much longer. And with humans, it takes a very long time. It's estimated that humans' risk assessment area takes about 23 years to develop, and um, you know, which really gives us an insight into what's going on with uh, with teenagers. Um, and it was very interesting to hear both uh, Siegel, Dan Siegel, and uh, Bessel van der Kolk discussing this. Uh, just recently, they they've de- been developing this uh, topic quite a bit. So in the primates and in humans, we have the special problem: we have to secure mom's loyalty, hardwired, not left to chance. And how is that going to be accomplished? This takes us back to the cartoon on the front page with Calvin that. Love, in quotation marks, is a neurochemical uh, device to secure maternal protection for a very long time. And um, and it works. Uh, there is something magic, as all, anyone who's been close to this can attest, there's something quite magic happens in the company of newborn babies and the special bonding uh, moms and babies. And we will argue that that is the most important event in the birthing sequence. You know, take care of that first and foremost because that's the trump card of the autonomic nervous system and the entire survival biology, including immune responses and uh, uh, behavioral states all uh, arises from autonomic. So we will be finding a great emphasis arising from porges, a great emphasis on maternal bonding and trying to minimize trauma, especially betrayal trauma, in the very earliest uh, days, weeks, and months of life. And notice I said betrayal trauma. That is... Uh, you know, it's one thing to fall off your bicycle, and it's another quite different experience to be pushed off your bicycle by someone from whom you were expecting care and protection. So betrayal trauma can be understood in a new light with Porges, that if betrayal was involved, the wound goes much, much deeper because the social branch has been um you know wounded and the um sympathetic we'll we'll see shortly we'll we defer downstream to the next uh uh autonomic branch so uh high emphasis emerging from Porges's work let's focus first and foremost on the social engagement system at the time of birth at the um, you know, birth itself and immediately thereafter. So, for instance, practices like infant quarantine, which became uh, fashionable in the 1880s for very good reasons because they had just discovered hygiene or the germ theory. It came in, but then it was overdone and misunderstood. And so we have generations now, including myself, who have... Uh, grown up in a system where the babies are taken away from the moms, which is the opposite of what the hardwired programming is calling for. And then here also a few other applications that I'll, you know, you can follow on your own. Um, So then the same social engagement that uh, is responsible for survival in primates and in humans especially, in the very earliest time, that same uh, equipment, the same neurology and the neurochemistry of that then recurs throughout life and brings us all the features that we call social cooperation, including bonding in couples and uh, communication, the whole uh, faculty of speech, the capacity to uh, operate in a teamwork, 
uh, to create um, uh, information exchange and transfer from generation to generation. You can uh, imagine the um, the enormous survival value imparted by the existence of the previously unidentified social engagement system. In my uh, undergraduate years, I was fascinated by Marshall McLuhan. My thesis was on the Gutenberg galaxy, and uh, it was really brought out by his work that we really learn in certain ways and we transfer information in certain ways, and we have different autonomic responses to different media. So, for instance, this phrase, the medium is the mass age, or the medium is the massage. And uh, he was really on to something, and now Porges is giving us a biology, an anatomy, a physiology for understanding uh, what um, McLuhan was describing. And turning one more page, we just have here the anatomy of the triune autonomic nervous system uh, laid out in some detail. And if you look closely, there are three colors. And the use of this slide is somewhat of a reflection of my own background in uh, body-centered therapies that it was discovered in 1948 and thereafter by Dr. Stone, Randolph Stone, that there are portals, so-called, in which we can physically touch uh, autonomic uh, features and have very beneficial effects. So we won't be trying to go into that uh, here, but for instance, the uh, Vegas pacemaker, perhaps you've heard of that as a treatment for various conditions, including depression. And um, there are some other methods that you may be familiar with. Well, we have three branches, and if we can have a, uh, a physical contact into those three branches, we can observe effects. And the uh, red is the parasympathetic, and the gold is the sympathetic, and the blue is the social. So this is something, depending on the nature of your practice, this is something you might want to uh, dig into um, a little further. Porges, for example, uh, at University of Maryland before he went to Chicago, he was um, involved in the listening project, which was a study for autism, which is largely an autonomic state in which the social functions seem to be disabled. And he figured out a way to get a portal into the nerves of the social engagement system, create a stimulus, create nerve firing along those neuronal pathways, which he did with sound, which stimulates cranial nerves five and seven in the middle ear. And the uh, videos of the listening project with these autistic children is just, it's brilliant to watch. The, uh, the children, you can just see them come to life in the presence of this special sound to cause that neurology to fire. Once again, the social engagement branch is the trump card. It has the capacity to override blockages in the sympathetic and parasympathetic. So this idea of an anatomy of a triune autonomic nervous system, this could serve us very well. The implications and possibilities for this are really quite extensive beyond our scope just now. But I invite you to uh, read in Chapter 6. There's a much more in-depth discussion of this. I believe the day is coming when the knowing an anatomy to behavioral states will help to give the behavioral sciences, including psychology, a more of a firm foundation and more, I think, respect in the scientific community. And I could imagine that in not d distant future, uh, newborn babies could actually be a uh, saliva swab would give a um, non-invasive indicator of the 
autonomic nervous system state, and we would quickly be able to see biofeedback for knowing the state with a view towards how can we optimize the social as much as possible at every step of the way. And if we had that biofeedback in place, we would immediately stop doing a bunch of things that we just are normal normally done in hospitals with babies. So then a couple more bits here. I'd like you to be aware that for most of the world, the um, autonomic nervous system model that we're using is actually quite out of date. It was developed a long time ago, and the language is a little sloppy. Uh, it needs to be updated. So, for example, if I did a pop quiz with everyone on this call and I said, uh, you know, name the branches of the autonomic nervous system and two or three key words to identify them, most people, at least when I try this in my classes, most people will say, oh, I can do that, sympathetic is fight or flight, and parasympathetic is rest and rebuild, or something like that. And it's really mixing apples and oranges. That is uh, propagating an incorrect view, an incorrect understanding of the autonomic nervous system. Fight or flight is a stress response, whereas rest and rebuild is a normal function. So we need to separate our language. If we're going to describe sympathetic and parasympathetic, we need to use the same type, either normal functions or stress responses. And this has led to all kinds of complexities. For example, in body therapies, many people have said that the goal of therapy is to restore a parasympathetic state because rest and rebuild sounds so much better than fight or flight. But from a stress response, it's actually the reverse. And we'll see that on the next slide. So I'd like you to consider um, taking some time with this slide and the next one and really uh, drilling into these words so that they become familiar to you. In the normal functions of the autonomic nervous system, the foundation of all your health, 80% or more of all health conditions are autonomic nervous system events, according to many sources, especially, for instance, the osteopath James Jealous. The normal functions of the ANS, they should be well known to you. So you can really identify when the social is up and running and functioning effectively. So things like language, a, a person who has a good social autonomic engagement system uh, working will be able to speak their thoughts and you'll be able to understand what they say. It'll be clear in meaning. They'll have a propensity for social organization. They'll feel at ease in social groups and they can interact, contact, communicate, things like that. Those are the signs that the normal function of the social branch are online. Then similarly, sympathetic is all about mobilization. And this includes uh, just the daily life, the waking up in the morning, the cortisol surges into the third ventricle, the uh, recreational excitement, muscular activity, uh, daytime alertness, all of these are sympathetic in its normal function. So we can sort of depathologize sympathetic to some degree because I think it has been overly pathologized, people not recognizing what the good side of sympathetic is. And then lastly, parasympathetic, rest and rebuild, baseline metabolism, heart, breath, digestion. You know, don't leave home without them. These are essential, um, sleep, meditation, and then you can see there's sex item for each of the three. That's been that's a whole specialized subject as well, and I think in sexual dysfunction we can uh, make some headway using this model to identify which part of the autonomic nervous system is in the foreground just from the behavior. 
Let's see, then. One more note here. I'd just like to flag Paul Ekman, his really uh, brilliant work. If you have not run into that yet, uh, he brings out how the autonomic nervous system is mainly incapable of inauthenticity or deception. This was the basis of the TV series Lie to Me. Perhaps some of you had a chance to see that. And especially the first three episodes really taught us a lot about how the autonomic nervous system, the facial gestures, are much more reliable than what the person is actually saying. So, for example, Peter Levine is just an expert at detecting these micro-movements and figuring out what is the status of the autonomic nervous system. So then we could turn to differentiating uh, now the stress responses. And once again, I would just like, if you could, take some time with this and figure it out. What are these arrows and which, what are the, the sympathetic is going to be the most familiar for you, probably. The parasympathetic is uh, somewhat well-known, shock, immobility, dissociation, depression. The social is maybe less well-known, but you can see words have been assigned. Uh, for all of those. Notice that these these little arrows, uh, Peter Levine describes them as secret doorways that can launch you from one state into another. For instance, if we have a loud sound in the room right now, we will all do the same thing, no matter our gender, age, education, culture. We'll all, you know, elevate, look around, and then we'll make eye contact with other people in the room. What was that? Did you hear that? These are autonomic, involuntary, innate responses. And uh, so these secret, secret little doorways, you can easily get from social into mob psychology, and you can get from sympathetic into freeze, and then in sleep disorders, there's a phenomenon called startle awake, in which the person actually does get to sleep, but all of a sudden they wake up in a sweat and they're quite agitated. And there's a whole biology, physiology for understanding what's happening with that, uh, studied especially by Walter Cannon in the 1930s. So then this bottom part, really, uh, this is the essential part. In the presence of novelty or threat, we will try our newest strategy first, social. If that does not work or has not worked in the past, as recorded in the amygdala, probably, we'll try our second, older strategy, sympathetic. And if that does not work, then we'll try our last. We only have three cards to play, a blue, a gold, and a red, and if we get down to our last card, that's the only card left, parasympathetic, as a stress response, we are actually in danger. Immobilization, deep depression, parasympathetic shock, these actually can be fatal. And uh, as many people, particularly Robert Scare, I think has brought this out, is that really the end game of trauma is parasympathetic states. And the main priority therapeutically is to get out of parasympathetic states as soon as possible because biologically it is actually dangerous. So then I'll give you one more slide here. I won't spend time on it here, but I would like you to think of becoming familiar and being able to recognize each of these states. So here are some key words uh, relying particularly on uh, Rothschild's book. Um, uh, this can really help. Your client comes in. If you're able to identify what state they're in, you will have a roadmap for how to help them. And in most of all cases, or all cases, the social, reestablishing the social, just like the rescuing hug, reestablishing the social is going to be a real key to recovery. So this is uh, maybe a good place we could have a little pause. Does anyone have a question? We'll take maybe three questions now, just to have a little interlude before we get to the next part. Hi. Um, I have a question in terms of um, 
someone who I'm seeing, and actually I've had this with a couple of people recently that I'm seeing in terms of presenting in um, that sort of um, a low freeze type state, but with a lot of uh, expressed internal sense of anxiety. Yes. And and I find that these seem to be harder to work with than somebody who's in just sort of dives, does that dorsal dive into that freeze, you know, while we're working versus them having spent probably long parts of their lives in that sort of frozen, not socially engaged place. And one person I'm working with in particular has two children, young children, and I'm concerned about you know, what may be happening for their little developing nervous systems in relation to mom's sort of um, right. almost a flat, flat presentation, a, a bit of flatness, but almost with a false smile periodically. It's it's um, distressing. Right. <laughs> and she's, she's in distress, but it's hard to reach her. You know, when I ask her about body states, she has a very hard time accessing any kind of physiological sense of what's happening on the inside for her. Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to um, give uh, uh, therapeutic instructions here uh, sure, just for sure. lack of information, but just as, as an observation, I think you're uh, correct entirely in your assessment, and I would say that this is actually um, an example of getting into danger zone. And then yeah. Uh, how to work with that uh to me the first um the first strategy and i would want to know a little more information before applying any of these but just to give an example the first strategy would be to induce movement by having her um maybe squeeze and release her muscles uh-huh because that's something it doesn't require like a self reporting it's just a body instruction, but it would be in the sympathetic and she's stuck down in the lower rung, and it would push her up up momentarily just the physiology of sympathetic she could squeeze right. and release and then squeeze right. and release she could uh, uh move and then not move. Or ways of introducing motion, and this is, uh, you know, back to the very beginning of our talk tonight, was the idea of um, the whole, the whole uh, strategy sort of revolves around inducing or reestablishing motion where fixation has come in. Now, if she has the capacity, you could actually educate her a little bit. Show her mm-hmm. a picture of what's going on. You know, you are primarily on this rung of the ladder, and our goal is to get you up to the next step. And some clients in dissociative conditions actually have retreated to somewhat of an intellectual capacity. So some people can actually be reached through a sort of a didactic uh, intervention. Say, so, you yes. know... Can you recognize that what's going on with you fits into this group? And then can you see these are the attributes of the next step up? And it's really vitally important for yourself, your family, your children to get up to that next step. So let's just do that artificially with some body practices and then uh, kind of develop it from there. Okay. That, that's helpful. She actually, the, most recently, she's very afraid of high-rise buildings, and my, my office is on the ninth floor. And so I actually offered to her recently, I'm, I'm, she's fairly new to me. I've only had a, a handful of sessions with her, but I offered for us to walk during her sessions Good. outside. So yes. that's what we started doing now. But I'm wondering maybe about maybe slowing the pacing at points and then maybe picking up the pace and sort of playing with exactly. that. Exactly, yes. Play with that. That would be a very good idea. The um, uh, agoraphobia, um, obsessive uh, uh, avoidance type behaviors seem to respond in many cases to one particular practice that we're going to get to shortly. 
Oh, great. Um, and so you might just try that with her. It's on page 187 in the book, and that has oh, worked very well. I've had uh, a couple of uh, people similar, you know, uh, avoidance-type behaviors and uh, somewhat depressed or dissociative, and um, that has actually worked. It took them in self-practice. They did a one exercise for about 15 minutes a day at least, um, on their own, and in the six weeks, they were able to, where they couldn't even leave the house, then they could uh, fly on an airplane. So um, I re- really recommend uh, that particular practice for that particular condition. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, maybe one more, anybody? In recognizing states of ANS, do the symptoms of one of the three types dominate in the person's presentation? Often, one will be predominant. It doesn't mean the others, uh, the anatomy of the others have dried up and withered away. They're still there. Everything is still there. But we habitually adopt strategies for coping. And if social didn't work at a certain key time in our life, say our infancy, then we won't try that one as much. And then that means we will devolve to a sympathetic strategy. And then if that didn't work, and in children, sympathetic is not very effective because they're too small and too dependent. If that didn't work, we could go to parasympathetic rather readily and we'll um, start moving towards adulthood in somewhat of a parasympathetic state. And this would be... uh, maybe behavioral, uh, sort of a flat affect and very obedient or um, uh, depressed or sullen, these kinds of behaviors. And those are indicators of danger. Now we're getting into the red zone, the parasympathetic layer. 